Anita Ekberg was the statuesque former Miss Sweden who became a global film sensation after cavorting in Rome's Trevi Fountain for Federico Fellini's La Dolce Vita. Although demure and innocent by today's standards, the scene caused a scandal and made the 29-year-old Swede a household name. Frank Tashlin, who directed her in the 1956 comedy Hollywood or Bust, the pun was intended, said that Ekberg's appeal lay in the immaturity of the American male, this breast fetish. There's nothing more hysterical to me than big-breasted women, like walking, leaning towers, he said. Ekberg was indeed a teetering tower. She was 170 centimeters tall and possessed a considerable bust, of which she once said, it's not cellular obesity, it's womanliness. Anita Ekberg was born on September 29, 1931, in Malmo, Sweden, one of a large family. As a youngster, she had no desire to be famous. She wanted to marry and settle down to a conventional life. Out walking one day, a talent scout spotted her and persuaded her to enter the Miss Universe contest. Winning as Miss Sweden, she gained a trip to Hollywood. A screen test did not bring much work and she returned home disheartened. However, she was determined to make good as an actress and began saving for a return trip. She moved to London in the mid-1950s but was lonely and hardly left her hotel. Having refused dozens of invitations to premieres, something impelled her to finally accept one offer. Her escort turned out to be Anthony Steele, a matinee idol alumnus of the rank school. They were married in 1956. Friends, please subscribe to my channel. It is not hard for you, but very pleasant for me. In her first British film, Zarek, she met her match in Victor Mature. Playing a native dancer, with a few spangles and bangles judiciously placed, who falls in love with Mature's hulking Zarek Khan. She teamed up again with Mature the following year for the thriller Interpol. At this time, her marriage to Steele was rarely out of the headlines, with reports of drunk driving, rows, and violent recriminations. Eventually, the union completely soured and they divorced after three years. She did not have time to mourn the marriage. Her performance in Fellini's La Dolce Vita the following year made her a star. Shot in Rome at a time when the Italian obsession with celebrity was at its height, she played the starlet Sylvia opposite Marcello Mastriani's philandering paparazzo journalist. The part fixed her in audiences' minds as the European blonde sex bomb, stylish, sensual, shallow, and ephemeral. Following the success of Fellini's masterpiece, Ekberg appeared opposite Bob Hope in Call Me Buona and Frank Sinatra in Four for Texas, both 1963. She was also considered for the part of Honey Rider in Dr. No, but lost out to Ursula Andress. When she did appear in a Bond film, it was both unwitting and unflattering. In From Russia With Love, 1963, Sean Connery shoots a spy escaping through a gigantic Call Me Buona poster featuring Ekberg's face. She should have kept the mouth shut. Ekberg's on-screen persona, a freewheeling man-eater from overseas, soon spilt over into her private life. Sinatra was one of the many leading men she was rumored to have taken as a lover, along with Errol Flynn, Yul Brynner, Tyrone Power, and Gary Cooper. She often played characters possessed of an untethered and wild spirit. As a war lady in the Mongols, 1961, striding in thigh-high boots among the slave girls cracking a bullwhip, for The Temptation of Dr. Antonio, Fellini's episode in the portmanteau feature Boccaccio 70, 1962, she was again the sex object, this time as the model featured on a Drink More Milk billboard poster who was brought to life to trap a puritanical doctor. In 1963, Egbert married Brick Van Netter, who later played Felix Leiter in Thunderball. They lived in Spain and Switzerland and in 1969 became entrepreneurs. Rick and I have gone into the shipping business. We found a cargo ship and we're in business with the captain, she said. Ours is a good marriage. There are so many good times in marriage that the bad times are really unimportant. Anyway, I learned from my parents that difficulties are there to be overcome. As with all sex symbols, age diminished her currency. By the end of the 60s, she was complaining about the lack of roles. I should be able to get work myself on the strength of my acting. I shouldn't have to sleep with producers to get parts. It's depressing to see parts going to actresses who can't act their way out of a wet paper bag, but who are friendly with producers, she observed. My life has changed quite a bit, of course. 
The Ferrari's gone, now I have a mini moke. The downward spiral continued throughout the 1970s. She made films, but they were more often than not B-movies with salacious titles such as The French Sex Murders, 1972, and The Killer Nun, 1979. Her scenes for Valley of the Dancing Widows, 1975, were left on the cutting room floor. At home, things also began to disintegrate. She accused Van Netter of cheating her over a car hire business they owned. The couple divorced in 1975. Two years later, her house was robbed, with the thieves stealing fur coats, jewels, and silver, the fruits of her once famous career. My last 10 years have brought nothing but bad luck, she said. After a second robbery in 2011, she appealed to the Fellini Foundation for financial help. It was a sad sign of decline from the Amazonian actress who had five decades earlier threatened paparazzi with a bow and arrow. Her final years were spent living in semi-reclusion in a rundown Italian villa outside Rome, where her only companions were two Great Danes.